Some of y'all need to get hit one time. <laughs> to bring y'all back to your senses, okay? Because that flesh gets to pumping you up, making you think you got more going on than you got going on. And then they say, you know, you out here in the middle of something, don't know how you got into it, and now you, you're getting whooped all the way back. But anyway, he said, what are you supposed to do when people do that to you? What are you supposed to do? Hmm? Boy, y'all sure is scared to say this stuff, man. I, no, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Now here... Here Jesus come and makes this statement, telling you all the things that can happen to you, you blessed because of that, and then turn around with the knots on your head and everything, he want to tell you, rejoice. And be what? Like you just won a lottery ticket. For great is your reward in heaven. What? I want to. Do we have any rewards? Yes. We got some. If you ain't been happy, <laughs> if you ain't been exceedingly glad and rejoicing, you may not have a lot in your bank account. Sometimes people are trying to draw from this spiritual bank account and they bankrupt. Insufficient faith. Praise God. But it said anyway, in verse 13, let me go on. I, that really wasn't part of that. I just haven't seen that. I just thought I'd throw that in. It didn't cost you nothing. It's free. But in verse 13, ye are. I know we taught it before. Let's go back over one more time. You are the salt of the earth. Now, that sounds very promising. But if the salt is lost its Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? In other words, now I've never really had salt that didn't taste like salt. I don't even know what that would taste like. But I'd be highly disappointed if I put salt on something and it, wasn't, it didn't taste like salt. You know what I'm saying? You know, I remember when they had, my wife used to have meals come to the house. I'm not being angry or nothing like that. But they didn't put no salt in the food. Just just straight across the board. But I came in uh, one evening and I decided that I would taste test. Now, I ain't never tasted anything that you couldn't put enough salt on. But I about got high blood pressure from trying to eat it because I could not get enough salt in it for me. Cause I like a lot of, I like a lot of seasoning in mine. You know, I can't, you know, it's got to taste something like fiery and all kind of stuff for me. But salt is a very powerful agent, one of the oldest agent in the world. I don't know when man began to first use it, but he, he found out that salt worked like ice, make dead meat stay. You know, I know when I was growing up. We had salt barrels with salt pork in it. Flies didn't even get in that. It always used to blow my mind how you can put all that salt on that bacon and stuff and leave it out. Ain't no flies going to mess with it. They don't mess with it. You just cover it up with salt. You would think some fly would have had a suit on. He can climb in and lay an egg. But they never did. Because salt it's one of those kind of things. It's necessary. I'd hate to see this world without it. All right? So here Jesus says, now, ye are the salt of the world. Now, what would that mean to me and you? 
Because he throws in that little part, you know, but you, you know, you can't lose your savor. You can't lose the saltiness. You can't lose the, the flavor of salt and still be the salt of the world. This is why sometimes I think as Christians we forget who we are. And we're waiting for the world to define us and tell us who we are. But see, we are the salt. See, when I hear all these people talking about all the time, man, about they took prayer out of school, took prayer out of this. What I need to ask you, did they take the salt out of you? Because the reason why the only way, <laughs> the only way that they could ever take prayer out of school is that they took salt out of you. Right? Because Jesus said, you are not the school district, not your government, but you are the salt of the earth. You are the influence. You are the taste changer. You are the preserver. Even the cure. Because salt cures. You have the answer. But most people are afraid to be salty. Most people are afraid to allow the salt to come out. So, when we live in this world, many of us, we believe that we need to start our own club. So we put all our salt shakers together. Put a top on top of that so it don't come out. Because we never know, we don't want to lose nothing, right? We never want to lose nothing. So we want to make sure we keep all our salt and hope that somebody else's salt shakes out. We'll grab their salt. But see, with Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. That means that God has placed you in a place in this world to be a taste changer, to be an influence, to change the flavor of stuff. We can argue about Hollywood and what they're doing, but really what is happening is that many Christians don't want to be the salt. We don't want to influence. They had us so we almost was ashamed to say we'll say. Except we go in a posse. Now we're in a posse and we got more than them. We don't mind. We'll talk loud and do all kind of stuff. But then when we buy ourselves, ain't nothing coming out. Ain't no flavor. We're going to make sure we don't influence anybody. But see, I believe God put us here to be an influence. Yes. And if we're not being an influence, I don't know how the expectancy or the expiration date does salt have that. I ain't even looked on a salt shaker. I should have. I mean, on one of them salt things. I don't know whether they got expiration date on or not when it's no good. Is it? Well, I do know back in the day, the salt they used to get, it did lose saltiness. You know what they made out of it? Highway. People walked on it. You ever feel like you're getting walked on? Maybe if you feel like you're getting walked on, it might be you lost a little flavor. Because if your flavor is gone, the only thing you are good for, the Bible say, yeah, yeah, you, you need to become the walkway. Because <laughs> that's all you're good for now. Because there ain't no flavor. You can't cure nothing. You can't change the flavor of anything in your life. And this is the whole thing. When we go into situation, it's because 
we're going in being salty. We want to spread. We want to give. We want to pour out, shake out what's in us. But what's bad is when you're shaking, ain't nothing there. So the salt of the earth, it tells that, you know, because a little bit of salt goes a long way. Have you ever got something too salty? It takes gallons of water. Gallons. Man, I hate to mess up something, mess around too salty. You know, somebody had to salt shake or too loose. Got ready to sprinkle. When you're too salty, you just you can't nobody bury you. <laughs> I don't care how much water you pour in there, man. They ever tell you, tell you, oh, man, it's still salty. It's so strong, powerful. You know, but it, when we are actively engaged in this world, which you are going to be, because God didn't call us to be hermits, recluse. He didn't call you salt so you can alienate yourself. Just the opposite. Everything he called you, had a direct impact up on the world. If you become what he says, you are the salt. Not only are you salt, he even talked about you being the light. And you see, when we look at it, that the saltiness of us is what's supposed to be influencing the people around us. As I always say before, it always has to start in the house, where you are, that's where salt, that's where your greatest influence should be, always. In where you live, where you are. Then it should spread to your neighbor. Your saltiness, influence, flavor. In Matthew chapter 5, 14, he goes on and says another thing. Not just salt. Ye are a city cannot be here. We got too many incognitos. Guy used to work at Sears and Roebuck. Man, he was a nice guy. We became real good friends. Matter of fact, we even baptized him in Jesus' name. I'll never forget. And his wife. But he knew I, he came up to me and said, uh, psst, he said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, sir. He said, me too. So then he, he pulled a card out real easy, like and handed it to me. Like, I don't want nobody to know I am. So he's kind of like incognito. A lot of people are lights and don't know they're light. And see, the thing about light is we think that they're supposed to look at us. But what light does is illuminate everything around you. How many of y'all, when you turn the lights on, you just go over there so you can see, look into the light bulb? You know why you turn that light on? Hmm? So you can see everything else around you because what light does, it illuminates everything else. What you see, you wouldn't be able to see the chairs without the lights on. So I don't come in and cut the lights on, they'll start looking at the lights, man. You know, because if I do, I ain't going to be able to see nothing. And so many of us are so looking at us. And not seeing what the light in us is that illuminating for us. See, I need to see what's around. I need to see what the light is illuminating. You know, that's the reason why today you can't turn on darkness. There ain't a switch in your house you can turn on darkness with. Hmm? So when you see darkness, guess what they're telling you? Ain't no light. Right? Because when light come on, guess what darkness does? It flees. 
Have you ever seen something flee so fast? Isn't there something? Just hit the switch. Bam. Darkness gone. And then there yet we live in total darkness. You know what darkness really in the Bible when it talks about darkness, it's talking about no understanding. How many of y'all ever look in darkness and see, know everything? You know, I come in this church sometime because I'm very economical. I won't turn no lights on. It ain't bad when I come in. It's only when I go in the office and turn the lights on. The lights, I just get adjusted. And I come out, ain't no lights on out here. I'm thinking in my mind, picturing in my mind where my steps should be. I know there's post over here. It takes a long time for your eyes to get adjusted to be able to see in darkness. And many of us today, we really walk in more darkness than we do light. It's because there's too many things that we don't understand that's in the dark that could be illuminated if we turn the lights on. We're stumbling over stuff that we could see if we just turn, turn the lights on. And so the Bible said, ye are the light of the world. Not, you're not to be here. You're not trying to put the light out. You're not trying to cover the light over. You're not trying to put it on the bushel, put it in the closet. He want the light he put in you to shine. If you allow the light to shine, you won't have to point out a lot of stuff to people. All you got to do is let the light shine. After a while, people begin to say things like, man, how, how come you're always so calm? I can see it. <laughs> Lights is on. The only thing we fear is the stuff we don't know. And the darkness, most people I know is scared of the dark. Right? Well, I, I, I'm not really scared of it, but it's not like I'm going to be walking into it just to show you I'm not. And I went down in Kentucky, there, big old caves down there. And you probably go crazy down there. It would be a good spiritual lesson for you, though. If somebody dropped you off down there, and I mean, when you're talking dark, yeah, you can feel this here. It is so dark in there, and if all the lights was off, I mean, you can't see nothing. You can't even do, see this. I'd hate to be in a place like that. But how many people live in a place like that now? Spiritually, the lights is not on. They can't see this close. They don't know if they've done something until they stumble over something. Neither do men light a candle, put it on a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You are the source of that light that God wants to put in the earth. You are that source. He's my source. We are the reflectors of that light that he said we are. And a lot of times that since we don't know what that light is, you know, we, we, we mess it up because we want to be good and then all of a sudden we be bad. Then we think the light went out. But his light is on. Okay, he, he keeps the light on like they do at Motel 6. The light stays on all the time. And a lot of times our actions, because we try to control the light, and we try to control where the light goes. You see, when you turn the lights on in here, I, I could not keep the light from shining over there. Once I turn the light on, it's the light's responsibility to illuminate. You know, I don't have a laser beam. He didn't say you're going to be a laser beam. He said you're going to be a light. 
So when I turn the light on, it's going to illuminate a lot more than I probably wanted to see, but the lights is on. Not only do I get a chance to see, a lot of time when your light come on, you help others begin to see things in their light they didn't know they had because the light came on. Jesus came into this world. He was a light. And man, did he ever turn it on. He turned on with words. Little old phrases like, there was two sons. One said he would and the other said he wouldn't. Then the one that said he would didn't and the one that said he wouldn't did. He turned the light on. People start thinking, oh. Then he comes say stuff in the midst of them Pharisees that really get them. They know he's talking about them. But he ain't called their name. But see, the light came on. The woman called in adultery. Light came on. See, they had darkness in their heart. They didn't know that that was still been in their heart. They, they thought because they saw her darkness that they didn't have none. And Jesus come along and, and say some of the most little simple thing. If any of you don't have sin, cast the first stone. Light came on. If God ever taken you back through memory lane, all of a sudden, when you thought you just got so good, and all of a sudden, he took you back. So here they are, living, have all these dark spots in their heart. Don't, done hit them well. So dark, they thought they'd never be exposed. But then Jesus messed around, make a little simple statement. He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then the Bible said, they begin to foul out kind of silently, kind of let that rock fall down to the ankle. Oh, I forgot all about that. But you see, one thing about Jesus, he forgot nothing. <laughs> he, he remembers everything. And when he do forget, guess what? He chooses to. He can choose to forget and forget. But it's his choice to forget. And the only way that you can make him remember it is that you didn't forget. Because <laughs> if you don't forget, you're going to mess around and make him remember. Right? Yeah, because, uh, yeah, you remember the, little, the guy got, you know, he was bad. I think his name, I don't know what his name was, but he was bad. Done a lot of bad things. But somehow or another, he got forgiven. You know, most, most people do small things, feel bad about the small thing than when you get caught doing the big thing. The one guy that had the little small infraction, he got forgiven too. The guy that got a big forgiveness package, he forgot. He forgot that God can't forget, but he don't have to. And the only way you're going to make God remember what you've done is by trying to remember what somebody done to you. Hmm? Guess what he done? He went out there, because it ain't nothing like feeling good and sanctified. I'm telling you, ain't nothing, it's a good feeling. When somebody has to ask you to forgive them and you, got, you hold the reins. Nope. You're going to pay me back for what you've done to me. Careful. You know what? You don't want God to pay you. Right, do you? I think people forget this because you're asking for your own paycheck. So he says, I got word, buddy. How that you went and exacted something that you remembered about him. And I forgave you of a whole lot more than you trying to forgive him of. And guess what I'm going to do for you? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you out. 
so you don't appreciate my forgiveness? Because if you appreciate my forgiveness, then you ain't going to have a problem forgiving other people. But since you don't appreciate my forgiveness, guess what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to go ahead and let you pay for yours. Now, how many of y'all know you can't live long enough to pay your debt? <laughs> how many of you know you was bankrupt when you came in and you didn't make no points living in the flesh? So now, if he makes you pay for it, because the only penalty for unforgiven sin is death. So how long do you have to work to pay it off? Till you die. And then guess what? You still, you still got a debt. Because <laughs> you can't live long enough to pay the price. But what isn't it simple that all you have to do is to forgive others just like he forgave you. If God didn't charge you anything, you have no business trying to charge somebody else something. Oh, here we go. I know this stuff is hard because Jesus, he ain't trying to be natural. He's trying to hurt my feelings. I can see that. God is trying to upset all my emotions. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He, he knows, Kelly. You know, I, this kind of stuff is kind of rough on me. He knows that. It's hard to be done wrong and then turn around and forgive them. So they can do it again. And again. And again. Oh, God, how many more does you want me to take? I want you to take 70 times 70. Take that. Well, how much is that? In case you don't multiply well, 490. In case you still want to go ahead and break it down a little bit further, every three minutes. Of every day, he can expect you to forgive. Isn't that something? He's got to be talking about something out of this world. Yeah. He's got to be talking about something that's not here. Here he's telling me to do these things. Now, let me ask you another question now. Do you think Jesus would ask you to do something more than you can do? Do you think he would ask you to do something that he wouldn't do? No? So you should feel really great when God allows you to demonstrate his nature. You ought to be really excited when God finally shows up in you as the light of the world. You ought to be really running owls on the fact that, you know what? I am the light. I am the salt. I'm influencing my world around me. My influence. You know, I, I, I'm not trying to win the whole United States of America. I'm not. Because if I did, I'd be traveling. Matter of fact, I'd be walking like Jesus while I get in the car. You'll meet more people walking than you will riding. You know, back in the day, they used to give you rides when they saw you walking. They don't do that no more. I don't blame them, though. I'm kind of like not doing it either, so I ain't, I ain't condemning you, nothing like that. I'm just saying, you know. But I have told y'all, if y'all see me walking, I am not doing it on purpose. I just want you to know that. I just want you to know, if you ever haven't seen me walking, don't just honk that horn at me. You, 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 need, you need to know that Kelly is not doing nothing for exercise like that. 
Okay? Just, just honk, okay? But anyway, <clears throat> people are, are tempted most of the time because most people have a real low value of themselves. There are people that really believe other people may be better than they are. They have, they, you know, uh, what well, someone said something about, well, I would do it, but you know, they need some big name person. No, Jesus didn't ever go for the big name guy. Look like all, you see all them little heroes in there, man, didn't even have names. A lot of people played in the parts of Jesus' uh, panoramic view of the world, and they didn't have names, just ordinary people. You know, no, no, no real name. What, what was those lepers named? Ten of them. They didn't even have no name. Did they? Forgot to mention them, didn't they? Ain't that something? And see, we we name droppers. We don't mind telling you who we know in the flesh. Hey, do you know uh, so and so? Yeah, me and him had lunch together. Okay. It, wouldn't it be great if you could brag about what me and Jesus had lunch to get together today? Huh? But we like the name drop. The more famous people. Man, you know what? Brother T.D. Jake shake my hand. Whoo. He autographed a book for me. Whoo, my, but Jesus done something greater than that. He took his pen and wrote something on your heart. <laughs> autographed you forever. And so here we get name drops. So when we feel unqualified, because there may be a name out there that people are propping up, so we feel not qualified. If I met a lot of Christians in my life and everybody always feel like they ain't qualified for nothing. First of all, it's not man that qualifies anybody. God will never call us to be who he said we are without him qualifying us to do that. Amen. Right? Them he called, he justified, and he qualified. And so he already has qualified, but our confidence oftentimes are shaken because we want self-qualification. You know, like Moses, you know, uh, I want you to go deliver my people. Oh, oh God, oh, oh. oh die, 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 die. He was speaking in tongues before he even got the Holy Ghost on him. Because all of a sudden, you know, God is calling him up. And he, he, you know. <laughs> See, because you know what he was looking at like most of us are. I keep telling myself this now. Kelly, you're getting too old. <laughs> you're getting too old, son. Man, you know what God can do. Age ain't nothing but a number with him. and It ain't even that. He seemed to wait till Moses get 80. I hope he ain't trying to repeat nothing, but he waited till Moses got 80. <laughs> and all of a sudden, now he wants Moses to go do something real great for him. Right? You know what we used to say. I wish God would have used me when I was younger. And you know why you're saying that? Because it would have been all you. You had the strength to run on. But see, when the Lord takes the go out of your get up, now when you get up, it's because he's giving you the go. But Moses said, I, 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 I can't do it. Isn't it strange when God desires to do something in your life and then you, you pose all these excuses, why? As if he didn't know what you know. See, so... It's not when you get qualified. It's when God has qualified you that this thing began to work. So it's not about your status. 
It's not about your financial situation. It's not about how smart you are. Because 90% of these people in this Bible here that God used didn't even have a high school diploma. <laughs> Uh-oh. That just sets you back, don't it? They didn't even have a high school diploma. And, and most of them didn't even know what a verb was. So I know it has nothing to do, and I'm not against education. Thank God for that. But when we look in this book, we realize these people were not scholars. They were not people that came out of schools and all that. They were just simple people who could hear God and obey God. When you go out to fight the giant, David, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel. You think that was in there? Wasn't. Well, what would give this little young dude the confidence to go out here and face something so big? He didn't even have a verse to go to. I can see us out there now. I'm coming out to you, giant, just like David did. You can't come out to the giant like David did if you didn't have the faith that David had. Before you go tackle that giant, when was the last time you killed a lion? When was the last time you killed a bear? And all of a sudden now, oh, you had a good service. In the name of, I'm going out there just like David. Don't you go out there like David. Because you know why you shouldn't go out there like David? Because you better know what sent David out there like that. And you may go out there like David didn't have what David had. And all of a sudden, instead of you having Goliath's head, <laughs> it may be his day to get ahead. <laughs> yeah, he may get ahead that day. You know what I'm saying? So you got you to, you got, you got, we got to balance this thing. We got to really balance this thing. Understanding that what God has made you, what, what he's doing for you, first thing, Quit trying to measure yourself by anybody else. Amen. God ain't got no two people here on earth. Just alike. As, as hard as I try to make everybody like me, as hard as I try, I fail with my kids. <laughs> I fail with my friends. I fail with everybody. I could not get them to see that they should be like me. What about you? Hmm? What about you? Are you still trying to make everybody like you? Yeah, because when they're not like us, we, we don't like them, right? We only like them that be like us. Why do misery hang out? Because they love good company, right? So you know what happened, believe it or not, you flock to what you like. If you like misery, I guarantee you, I can tell you what your circle is like. And everybody you talk to is going to be talking the same miserable stuff. And the only thing you're going to do every day is try to out misery everybody. <laughs> right? Oh, you can't be as miserable as me. You let me tell you what happened to me. Please. Is there anybody experiencing the real joy of God? Hmm? Let's hang out and rejoice about the goodness of God. Talk to me about what Jesus is doing. Don't tell me what the devil is doing because he's been defeated. When you want to get victory, let's talk about victory. Maybe we can influence one another to strive. Grab, reach higher than we ever reached before because Jesus put us in this world to be salt and light. And I, I'd be the first to tell you, not condemning anybody, but I, I, I feel I failed in a lot of areas as far as being the salt and light of this world. Because I don't know how many times I felt in my earlier year, some people did not deserve this salt. 
And I did not shake none on them either. I found a lot of people that I felt like they should not even enjoy the salt that I had in my life. Matter of fact, I didn't want their flavor to change. Especially those that done me wrong. My first test in getting saved, man, was my enemy got in the car with me. I put duct tape on my salt shaker. Made sure none came out because I was just getting in church and I really don't want him to get saved. Because what he had done to me at that moment was unforgettable. Please, God, don't save him. I know I'm no one. I realize I, I'm the only one to do that. Don't worry. I just look this way. Because you, you, there are people in your life, you want them to pay some stuff before they get saved. And you don't want to shake no salt on them yet. Right? You think they need to reap some stuff, right? And so you don't want them to get saved right now. No, Lord. They're going through, yeah, God just paying them back. Hey, get them, Jesus. Get them, Jesus. Get them. And then when God gets through getting them, now you can go and say, take a little salt on Yeah, God's good, ain't he? <laughs> but inside, you, you're so happy. The reason why he's good because you think God done paid them back. God lets you go, though. Question statement. Brother Craig, you cool? <laughs> All right, we're going to let you go there. Hope we said something tonight. It's just a little simple lesson. That's all. Salt and light. 